We start now to one of the different surveys that we can have a picture of the system. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, there is like my present duty. Now, welcome and introduce uh, today's esteemed speaker. Many of you actually know him uh, because I think, is it your second or third visit? First time. Third time. So, the face is at least familiar to you. You have not directly interacted with him, but I do request to directly interact with him. And uh, I think the introduction could have been longer than whatever I'm telling you, but I have to make it brief, otherwise you will miss this interesting talk. So uh, Professor Christian Mills is a professor of theoretical physics and philosophy in Kiel, Leuven in Belgium. It's interesting theoretical physics and philosophy. I noted that. Uh, he is also a member of the Scientific Council of the Royal uh, Meteorological Institute of Belgium. And he did his PhD from Rutgers University in the year 1988. His uh, primary areas of research are statistical physics, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, and mathematical physics. He has made pioneering contribution towards understanding the role of entropy production, uh, particularly in characterizing systems away from the equilibrium. And he has served in editorial board of many different journals, uh, like Journal of Mathematical Physics, Statistical Journal of Statistical Physics, Journal of Physics A, uh, et cetera. He is also author of the very, I think it's a very interesting book, at least the title tells me that. It's Facts of Matter and Light. Uh, about the key experiments which advanced our understanding of physics and uh, the title i'm interested in just by hearing the title so i'm absolutely sure it's very interesting i personally am interested in how to continue and he writes popular levels scientific articles in english dutch and french so uh, as you know that uh, professor Chatendranath Bose, in whose name this institute has been built. He was also a person who always believed in science certification in mother tongue. And he set up actually the Hongyu Began Mauritian, which is because it's our mother tongue is Bengali and we believed in science education and so on. So, with that, uh, I welcome today's speaker, Belinda, the lecture. Uh, unfortunately, I have some other obligations, but happily, but I'm absolutely sure it's going to be satisfying. Thank you very much. Good instructing talk. <laughs> And also a small present oh. so that you remember us. <laughs> So yes, uh, thanks a lot for the very kind introduction. Thank you all for being here. Um, I hope you forgive me that I already start to feel a little bit at home here. I have only been here two times, so this is the third time, but pleasant atmosphere, the passion for science, the great hospitality, uh, all things I am very grateful uh, about, and I'm very pleased and honored to also be here this afternoon for uh, Colloquium, and this colloquium, uh, well, the title has this uh, Gerlach in the middle of it, so that's what it will be about. Uh, so, in that sense, it's a bit of a colloquium in the sense that it will not be like a very specialized thing. It's something that we all know about, more or less. And I will try to add uh, a particular view on it, 
uh, which I hope uh, has also some pedagogical qualities. Who knows? So let's see what will happen. Um, on the other side, um, having in mind that uh, we are in the 20s of the 21st century, we are about to get a lot of anniversaries having to do with uh, quantum revolutions, quantum revolutions together with the other revolutions in physics of the 20th century. Um, and in particular, there will be lots to celebrate. Uh, 24, there will be the Breuil with the matter waves. Um, there is, of course, I'm sure also this uh, center will have a lot of celebrations and uh, remembering Bose Einstein condensation or Bose statistics more generally. There is 25, the Heisenberg matrix mechanics that will come up with also the real discovery of the electron spin by Goldsmith and Uhlenbeck. And then it continues in 26 with wave mechanics of Erwin Schrödinger, and that continues. So we are up to a lot of quantum anniversaries. But in fact, um, I'm a little bit too late for that one, for the Stern Gerlach, as this one was really something that was done in 1922 already. Um, in fact, it started even before 22, but okay, we are actually the paper that we worked on uh, together with Simon Krekels, Wat Struive, and Kasper Meertz. We started in 1920, in 2022, sorry, uh, for being ready, but we were not ready. In fact, we were only ready like a couple of weeks ago, um, but still uh, before the end of 22. So the point of, of my talk will be like two, for there will be two parts. One will be more historical, reminding you of the fun of the Stern Gerla experiment in that time. And the second part will be something that probably you have not seen. Um, and it, I would describe it as adding a little bit of color to the usual presentation of the Stern Gerla experiment. So let's start with uh, basically the first part, which is a bit historical. Um, so the main player of this talk uh, are, of course, Stern on the one hand and Gerlach. Otto Stern was like more the, the theoretician of the two. Um, in fact, his specialty was more in the direction of physical chemistry. Um, but of course, in that time, he has been exposed to these developments in quantum mechanics. And he had, of course, many discussions. He was also an assistant of Einstein in, in 1913. And it was when he was in Frankfurt in the group of Born, Max Born, you know, the grandfather of Olivia Newton John, if you know Olivia Newton John, um, that he was working on this experiment, the so called Stern Gerlach experiment, <laughs> before he went to be the first director of the Institute for Chemical, uh, Physical Chemistry in Hamburg. He got a Nobel Prize in, uh, in there you see him. Um, I think maybe around 1913. Uh, the other person of the experiment is an experimental physicist uh, from Tübingen originally, but of course he was also in Frankfurt around that same time doing the experiment of Stern Gerlach. And it was Stern who was really taking the initiative, as far as we understand, asking Gerlach, who was doing experiments with magnetic fields, to see something that uh, Stern was understanding was, was very strange. And the strange thing that many at that time seem to have found it strange in the sense that um, Schrödinger described that like it as a monstrosity and also Stern was very much uh, flabbergasted by it, was related to the Bohr Sommerfeld theory of the of the atom, planetary atom model, where there was this old quantum mechanics with what is called space quantization. I need to lecture you on this 1913 Bohr model, neither on the extensions given by Sommerfeld, but one of the upshots of that, which um, maybe when we teach goes by as if it is normal, uh, was or is that there is supposedly a quantization of the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum. So in the sense that the orbit of the electron uh, associated to that an orbital angular momentum would also have a quantization in space. So it would not like go all of the directions. And um, 
some people obviously that was a very strange thing uh, together with other things i mean it should for example also emphasized the strange things about quantum jumps and uh, that was a direct inspiration so this supposedly spatial quantization this quantization in the direction of the angular momentum in the direction of the external magnetic field that uh, led uh, people like Stern of the Bayer to, uh, to say, well, what you can read here. Um, so, for example, that if this nonsense of Bohr should, in the end, prove to be rational with physics, which is in a private uh, letter, so not a public statement, but it does say something about the atmosphere, or Peter de Bay uh, speaking or uh, writing to Gerlach that uh, one should not take it seriously. In a way, from the kind of view of philosophy or science, it probably also says that mistakes help, you know, mistakes help. And to insist on mistakes sometimes is a good thing for making progress. And you can say nonsense uh, as long as people will criticize you. That's that's fine. No, that's not, that's saying something, and also, although I'm not saying it was obvious. But anyway, let's say that Stern was saying, speak about the nonsense of war. Okay, so um, they set up an experiment. This is the picture that you find everywhere. So a standard textbook is there, the, the Brunson and Yorker uh, textbook. And that's the usual picture you're seeing. So let me go through a number of things that I'm sure you all know very well, but just to get on the same page, as they say. So the experiment originally was done with silver atoms. They uh, are, of course, prepared in a little oven here. Um, they come out basically at 750 meters per second in the in the experiment. So they why silver atoms? Well, uh, they tell me silver atoms are like sufficiently large, massive. Um, they are easy to evaporate. They are of course neutrally charged. They are chemically all sort of stable. So there are in fact that was not immediately silver that they were using. They went through the whole. Uh, table of Mendeleev to see what would be fitting best, but so they ended up with silver that worked. And they have a narrow beam, which is about um, a percent of a micrometer or something like that to collimate the beam. And then they go through a magnetic field, but this is perhaps not the best figure here. It is a little bit better. The important thing is that you emphasize that it is a non uniform magnetic field, right? So it is not that you are. Um, want to just uh, exert uh, simply a torque, but you also want to move them up or down, but you would like to exert a force, which is going up or down because of this non-uniform magnetic field. <laughs> and then there is this glass plate. In fact, uh, here you should imagine that the distance between the magnet and the glass plate is about a meter. So it needs some time. I mean, the longer it is actually, the more you will have uh, the splitting of the beam. Um, so, yeah, so, so you know, there is something immediately strange for, like, say, the modern textbook is that the silver atoms, uh, I believe they have 47 electrons, so there are like 46, which is uh, core electrons, in the sense of in a closed shell, there's no orbital magnetic uh, moment, but and then the, the free electron is a 5s electron, which also doesn't show orbital angular moment. So these things were somehow not known or not sufficiently known. But anyway, that was the setup to try to get uh, to see this direction of quantization. Um, so the non-uniform magnetic field, so the magnetic field was of, it's like one Tesla, you can imagine on average, and, but it has a gradient which was about five Tesla per centimeter. I mean, this experiment, of course, has as such, uh, you can do it classically. Uh, I mean, just the experiment you can always do, but the classical physics would be like using the Larmor theory. You would have a precession in, uh, if, if the magnet is pointing in the Z direction, there would be a precession around it. And then the magnetic moments would by the often be randomly distributed. So the Z component of the magnetic field, which would be the amplitude multiplying the gradient in the magnetic field, that would be force uplifting the force. And so you would basically see uh, a line on the screen. Just the random dipole distribution would take care of that. So there is clearly a sign of uh, directional quantization or space quantization, let me not say it like that. If you would not just see a, a, a continuous line, 
but you would see uh, basically two spots, right? So the idea was that you would also have a kind of classical picture would be that still you have a force in the z direction, so in the vertical direction, which is uh, proportional to the gradient of the magnetic field, but the prefactor is not just the z component of the magnetic moment, which would be a continuous distribution, but would be the Bohr magneton. So a particular number, specific number, which is, uh, what is it, something like E times H bar over the mass of the electron, there's somewhere a factor of two also. Uh, that would be the, the quantum prediction. The classical prediction is just a yeah, magnetic moment in the Z direction, just as a continuous state. Um, so that would be the force, the Stern-Geller force. By the way, uh, maybe I'm saying things that you will realize or know, this is not a Lorentz force, right? So you don't do the Stern-Geller experiment with three electrons as such. That's, it's, uh, in fact, if you would have this Lorentz force, it would screw up basically the experiment, really related to the non-uniform magnetic field that, basically speaking, gives you a force um, that separates to some extent, either continuously or discreetly, the, the beam of silver. I think. Yeah, so that's the, the experimental setup and some of the, the main ingredients. So um, that's what they set up. Um, I think I have said already that, that uh, even though the ground state of uh, high orbital angular momentum is zero, that indeed they did see this, this uh, little eye here showing what they thought was directional quantization, the space quantization of the orbital uh, outside electron of, of the silver atom. Um, here it is written spin up and spin down, but the word spin was not really used I mean, in that time and such, right? Just to tell you that really the electron spin was only pronounced loudly and uh, theoretically and also experimentally later at the end, towards the end of the day, right? In the, finally, in the experiments and the theory of Fulbeck and Goldsmith. There's a longer history with people like Crony and Pauli. Uh, but I'm skipping this part of the history. All of these things are also well documented. You can easily read about that. And, um, but it's a kind of an interesting history. Okay. So just continuing, uh, what I also like to say, I mean, we don't we will look into the whole thing, but this is an account of, um, of Stern, something that, you know, there was a lot of luck in the experiment, as they say. Um, actually, Stern already gave up, uh, and Gerlach continued with some extra money that he got from Born, who was giving all these lectures on relativity and the income of that one could spend on continuing the experiment. But also, uh, a lack of money also helps sometimes to do successes in experiment because, at least in the words of Stern, he said that we, my salary was too low to afford, afford food cigars, so he smoked bad cigars. And it seems that since they had a lot of self in them, um, just by looking and staring at the plate, what was not visible to the eyes of Gerlach because it didn't breathe out the, the smoke of the cigars, became visible in the sense that it turned the silver into sulfur sulfide, jet being black on the glass plate. And in that sense, one could start to see really the, the discreteness or the eye in the glass plate where the silver atoms were making the black dots now on the screen. Um, so that was finally the, the postcard that they sent to Bohr. Um, Unfortunately, the writing is a bit, uh, I, I cannot really see too much of the writing, but it is a postcard basically saying that um, it's success, you're right. Uh, we have proven directional quantization. And uh, Gerla in particular was very happy to tell Bohr Stern, Bohr Stern that Bohr is light after all, and uh, Pauli maybe more explicit say this should uh, convert even the non Stern. So um, just to make sure the sizes, some of course these are uh, that would be the that would be without the without quantization, and this is the eye that is splitting that was the final phrase or sign for what I wanted to see. And indeed, they published this paper in March already of 1922. 
Um, and the title of this paper is exactly that. They had experimental evidence of directional quantization. That's exactly what they wanted to do, and that's exactly what they believed they were doing. And the, the first sentence, basically, of the paper is again confirming that we have direct experimental proof. So look at the words proof, look at the word direct. Direct experimental proof, what can you wish more, right? Of the directional quantization. So referring and referring explicitly to Bohr's model and some Sommerfeld's extension for the spatial quantization. Now, um, as we learn in school, that was not quite the way it was. Um, in fact, the, even the outer electron, there is no orbital angular momentum of that electron in the silver atom. So that was with insight once it was understood through the work of people like indeed Pauli and in particular Uhrenbeck, Houtsmith, more later also Diracano. Uh, it was more that the first experimental evidence of uh, a very strange, uh, what is said in German, I mean, quantum mechanics was German in that time, right? Zwei Deutigkeit, a certain, um, to say, two-foldness, uh, two-foldness in a certain angular momentum of the electron, which then can become known as the electron spin, right? Um, and that, of course, is, is it really a quantum feature. I mean, if you would ask yourself what is, what is quantum, probably most of us would include this, this thing, right? This, this spin is something which has no is no direct uh, classical um, analog. It's really an internal uh, thing that, that has deep consequences and really um, it's very important also for, for understanding the, the table of mental death and all that. Okay, so um, this is, as I said, a didactic classic, which we all learn. And if you take no matter what book, whether it is more phenomenological or more mathematical, you will learn about this Stern Gerlach experiment. And I like also this, uh, this quote here by Julian Schwinger, because indeed, you know, some experiments in the history of physics have become like paradigmatic of understanding, explaining what is the true thing. Uh, you probably all would agree that an important place for quantum mechanics would be double slit experiments. Right, where the interference of also matter waves of electrons, for example, would be visible. Uh, perhaps there are other experiments like that. Of course, there's the spectroscopy. Passion lines, by the way, Gerlach was a student of Passion. First, it is one of the experimental physicists who did the, the hydrogen lines. But another experiment which is paradigmatic for setup of quantum mechanics is indeed the stern gerlach experiment. Um, somehow it has grown beyond its boundaries by almost being the experiment that illustrates the basic axioms of orthodox quantum mechanics. Some books basically take this Stern Gerla experiment as, as illustrating what these axioms mean. And I refer to things like um, you know, the fact that you have the three components of the spin, and that if you measure one and then the other, that it's a mixed up. And, all of these kind of things, the collapse and all of aspects uh, that one has to teach. In fact, in Belgium, uh, there is this wave, maybe also here, that uh, people think that one should also teach quantum mechanics in, um, in high school. So for kids, say, 16 or 17, maybe it happens in India, I'm not sure. But in Belgium, you know, maybe a little bit behind, and we want to also teach quantum mechanics. And people, the first reaction when they say, what will you teach? except for phenomenology and kind of basic experiments, the first thing that they speak about when doing mathematical work is it's the stern gerlach experiment. So in that sense, it's a, it's a didactical tool and, um, and important, it seems, for what people have in mind when they speak about um, quantum mechanics. OK, now um, this will be the slide where I turn the story. So I go from like the standard history to the new future. Um, and the, mo the most important thing about these pictures 
is that um, it is all again for textbooks that you may uh, appreciate. Shankar Sakurai would love to work with it. That's again about all of that discussion is about the uh, Stern Gala experiment. But what I like now today about these pictures is not only that sometimes the beam is not going from left to right, but also sometimes goes from right to left. But even more than that, I like the fact that there are these lines. See these lines here? Lines. What are they? What are these lines? Well, of course, they are innocent. They are just helping us to, you know, to imagine this beam and the splitting uh, help for the eye, maybe not, but just, you know, adding a bit to make it more comfortable to us to understand that. So I'm taking this comfort as a great comfort, and I would like to insist that the comfort is real. That is what I'm going to try to do now, which is a bit unusual, as you would see. I hope you are ready. Let's start with that. Um, so what about these trajectories? Well, what can we do? And in what sense can this be correct? In what sense can this be real? In what sense can this be helpful? All right. So um, I think probably the only standard, <coughs> if I can say so, or, or, or some whole referring to authority that I have to speak about the things I'm speaking about is the, the book of Roger Penrose, who will be, you know, I mean, it's a book like that, but it's the Long Road to Reality. Uh, it's, it's 2005 book. And there he has pictures like that. And um, this is about the Dirac electron, and he is doing these zigzag pictures. In fact, he speaks in a familiar tone about these particles. Uh, in fact, it's a Dirac electron, but he splits up the Dirac electron in two types of particles. The zig and the zag. There's the zig particle, which is the left-handed chirality particle, and there is the right-handed zag particle. And okay, the history is much more interesting than that. Um, he also associates to that in the standard normal the parity breaking of the weak interaction, which where the, the intermediary bosons only interact with the zig, the left-handed chirality. Let me perhaps skip this broader picture. Except for well, saying that in a way, this is this is what we are also going to do. So, um, if you are familiar, but there is no need really. But if you are familiar with the standard model, then you know that fundamentally you start with all particles being massless. And there is a mechanism which was also um, sixty years after the presentation or so uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, which is this proton X mechanism where you get a mechanism to create mass. And this mass is somehow the constant Higgs field after a certain phase transition of okay. the So the mass is somehow giving you here the coupling or the amplitude of the coupling between the left-handed and the right-handed wild state, it's called. So you think, here's the picture, is that from the standard model of elementary particles, one understands the electron as composed as well, not composed, that's not the right word, but like an oscillation or a, or a flipping between two states, which are the two wild electrons, which are both massless, so everything is massless, but they are coupled. This flipping rate or this tumbling rate is proportional to the mass of the electron, the ground, the ground energy of, of the electron. That's the picture that um, emerges from the standard model and which is also in this uh, section on the Dirac electron, that's how Penrose reject, presents it. So what has this to do with trajectories? Well, we come to that. So I remind you, we were now speaking about the direct elect, direct electron as flippers flipping of two wild states. No, um, let me skip these uh, things, but let me just uh, oops, oops, but, uh, let me just ask the question together with you. But are these six and zags real? Uh, Iraq asks in the book, and um, hey, it's up to you to answer that uh, question, of course. But um, Penrose is saying, or writing rather, that I would say they are as real as the Dirac electron is real. Um, so, a highly appropriate, idealized mathematical description of the electron. 
that's the way, nothing more than just a highly appropriate description. Okay, so let us come to the to the time when the frog jumps into the pond. <coughs> this is a picture of something which is nothing to do with the Dirac electron. This is a picture of a trajectory of so-called run and tumble particles. Perhaps some of you have heard about this uh, fashion or more than a fashion, this culture of uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics where people speak about active matters, active particles, and a toy model, which is helpful in this, uh, for this active matter, is a so-called run and tumble particle. And uh, what happens is if you look at the position time is the particle moves at a certain propulsion speed, and then there is a random time where it just uh, tumbles, means changes its direction. In one dimension, it would just be the reverse. That's a run. You have running with a certain specific speed, and then you tumble. And if in two dimensions, you would randomly change your direction and continue like that. In one dimension, you would just reverse your direction. I said run and tumble, like like you would do if you are not know very well how to do ski skiing, you just run, and then when you want to turn, you see a T, you just fall down, down and you change your direction and you continue. That's now so this picture, of course, is not the same as that picture, but it reminds us a little bit of that picture, right? Um, after all, in the zigzag picture of Penrose, there are these the speed of each zig and zag is at the speed of light, there are the massless wild electrons. And then there is the flip rate, which is related to the mass of the electron. So in that sense, it is a bit, it's a bit similar. Um, so to give you a bit more context, if you um, think about what is it the moment for this run and tumble particle, so there are, of course, it's, it's so, to some extent an idealization, highly appropriate mathematical idealization a little bit in the words of Penrose of certain bacteria like E. coli, which have this kind of having of um, having an equation of motion. It's an overdamped equation of motion where the position as function of time is just given a certain speed mu, but the direction, the theta, <laughs> is chosen randomly at the times of jumping. And if you flip very fast, you go to a kind, you go to a brown in motion. If you're not flipping very fast, you're called an active particle. So in other words, in this motion, there is a persistence. Persistence in that you stubbornly continue your way until it is time by a random clock most of the time, exponential distributed time, to flip your direction, change your direction. Okay, so I'm going to explain how, in what way, you know, we can think of the Dirac electron as an active particle, and all that gives rise to trajectories, which um, can be visualized for the Stern Gala experiment. That is what I'm going to do. And what is the meaning of the trajectory in the You will see just a, just a, just a, oh, there you see the trajectory of bacteria. Okay. The, so it's a good uh, introduction to an answer to your question to, um, to uh, remind ourselves of Henry Boltzmann, who was at once asked, what is the meaning of atoms and what is the meaning of these trajectories, the Newtonian trajectories of molecules and atoms if we have never seen them and probably never could see them in the 19th century. And um, I think that in this popularity shift, he was answering in a way which is close to my heart also uh, by saying, you know, these lines that we are drawing, we cannot help ourselves, no? We cannot help ourselves to draw these lines. And then Boltzmann says, oh, but our own thoughts, something different from these images. So let's just visualize our thoughts in the best way we can. That is what is the program of this colloquium. Okay, so let us visualize those electron trajectories, and who knows, uh, perhaps it is useful to understand how uh, more constructively, mechanically, apropos mechanics is mechanics, how we can speak about, well, I will not emphasize this interference, but this, this uh, Stern-Gedda experiment may be 
collapse, maybe spooky action at the distance uh, is non locality that we have in quantum. So that is the program that was the motivation also to add to that Stern Gerlach experiment somehow combine Stern Gerlach experiment, the so called paradigm of some part of quantum mechanics, with much more re recent ideas having to do with entanglement. Okay, so what is our strategy to get to trajectories? Um, so we start, of course, from the wave equation. We will be doing quantum mechanics, right? So we will solve the wave equation. There will be a wave function. We will not forget about it. It will always be present. It will be very important. There will be a wave equation. In particular, it will be basically the Dirac equation or the Pauli equation to discuss the specifics of the stern gerlach experiment. And we will need to deal with it. We need to solve it in a non-uniform magnetic field. Second thing is that you have to understand that if you have such a wave equation, not only do you have the wave equation, but you also have the continuity equation for the conservation of probability. So psi squared, basically, which is according to the Born rule, the probability when you would do a measurement of finding the position, the position representation of the wave function. And of course, if you will set up trajectories, we want the notion of quantum equilibrium, I'm speaking, I'm mixing quantum mechanics with statistical mechanics here. We want that at every moment, if we would uh, look at a trajectory at every fixed slice of time, the distribution of the trajectories of the positions is exactly given by the Born rule, which means the wave function squared at that time. That's what we want at every time. Moreover, the whole picture of the trajectories has to be time reversed and varied and satisfied depending on your wishes, the various symmetries that we have uh, in the usual physics treatment of the Stern Gerlach, for example. So that's, that's, of course, what we want to have also. Then, once we have the equation for the, for the probability, we just make a general little switch in our head. Uh, we think of probability as another word for density of the electrons. So if you have many independent electrons, for example, the probability the other law of large numbers, as you would say, correspond to where you indeed find the part. Okay, um, and the unusual step, the unusual step is that step. You see, this is an equation for the equation of motion for probability. It would be like a Liouville equation or a Liouville von Neumann equation, or in other contexts, it could be called a Mast equation or a Fokker Planck equation or a Smolikovsky equation. But we are used in statistical mechanics, but maybe in all of physics, we are used to a dual complement to that equation, which is called the Langevin equation. Langevin equation is directly telling you what are the position, what is the equation of motion where you introduce noise to get the continuity equation. So that's exactly what we will be doing. We will give the equations of motion corresponding to that continuity equation. Of course, the wave function will be present there. Wave function will be present there in our Langevin equation. And then the end of the story is simply that we will simulate or just draw the trajectories and see what we can learn from it and whether we can have the fun as uh, announced. This is a program which is also known as the De Bohm pilot wave interpretation, but where you're using the wave function to guide the particles. So I would like to understand for the Stern Gerlach experiment what are these trajectories. How can we obtain is one thing, but then once we get them, is it useful? Is it interesting? Is it something like watching color television? Okay, so um, time is running also with us in this talk. So I'm not going to emphasize too much the mathematics, but part of this is pure mathematics, right? So we can have, the, let's say, here the Dirac equation for a four-component spin-off. The wave function is the complex value uh, components or complex wave functions. And then we do what we announce. We go to the Carroll basis, the wild state, and we basically get two wave equations for the right handed and the left handed uh, wild states. And they are coupled, and they are coupled exactly by the mass of the electron. And um, what you can do now is you look at the densities as we do in the form rule. We just take the psi plus squared and the psi minus squared. And what we get is these equations. I mean, these are mathematical conclusions that we obtain um, if we do this uh, well state basis. 
and we obtain couple differential equations for the density of left handed and the density of right handed. And perhaps you recognize what you have. You have the flow, the P flow with a certain propulsion speed, and then you have a coupling which uh, you easily interpret as you know this A is like a, a, the probability or at least the rate to go from the minus to the plus, and this is from the plus to the minus. This is most uh, and indeed all of that uh, can be done. But before I do that, maybe let me just remind you of a very simple example. Suppose I do Brownian motion, that's the equation of Brownian motion where you have white noise and the continuity equation or the Popper Planck equation or the Smolikovsky equation is that word. So that would be the diffusion equation. That would be the continuity equation for the Born rule for the Dirac equation. And that is what we simulate. Right. So this duality between the Langevin and the Popper Planck equation. That's exactly the same thing what we do. But with one big X, so the run and tunnel is also that run and tunnel. This is the equation of motion where sigma t is plus or minus one in one dimension. There's no picture of that. They flip alternate alpha, and that's the Fokker Planck equation or the mass equation for the run and tumble. So you have a free flow with this uh, velocity here, and then there is the, the flipping rate alpha for creation and annihilation of your plus or minus moving body. Right? So, so that's an uh, analogy. So what is the difference with the Dirac equation? The difference with the Dirac equation is that this propulsion speed and these rates, in fact, they are different, these rates, they are given by the wave function, the solution of the Dirac equation. So they are space-time dependent propulsion speed and tumbling rates. So for a bacterial interpretation, which is not very helpful, perhaps, is that you have chemotaxis. Somehow it depends. The foot is distributed according to the wave function, which is a complex valued food you have. And there is a way of heating that food, digesting it so that it gives rise to propulsion speeds and, uh, and the rates of, of becoming a seed versus a sack. Okay. So this is not an interpretation. Well, I mean, the words are, of course, part of an interpretation, but this is pure mathematics, right? Starting from the Dirac equation. Okay, so uh, this is the summary of what I just say, and if you like, this is the formula that you get in terms of this of the point, and the sigma is no longer plus minus one, or the uh, holy mouth wishes. But that's, you see, how these solutions of the Wall equations or the Dirac equation enter into the in the Fokker Planck equation. And then the next thing is that you're going to do exactly the simulation of these things where the propulsion speed is the speed of light and there is a, the speed of light uh, and there is a tumbling rate which is proportional to what is called the, the amplitude of the so-called zitterberg label this jittery motion of the of the electron okay um just maybe i want to go back to this slide for one second yeah so you see in sakurai this is more or less announced, except that there are quotes. It is tempting, so I, I, I'm happy to be tempted. So he said, it's tempting to see that as some kind of velocity. That's exactly what we are doing. We are tempted. So we leave all the quotes and we just do it. But this is what they say in Sakurai is being announced as being a possibility to be tempted. So if you tell me you can be tempted, why not take the chance? No? All right, uh, so that's what we are simulating now, basically, except that we are not simulating it for the free uh, Dirac equation, but we are doing it in a non uniform magnetic. Nothing else. That's exactly it. So I'm uh, not going to talk about the diffraction or the interference. So this is what you do when you get a double slit, you get indeed interference. On the screen, but let me know these are many particles of different colors. This is exactly for interference and diffraction what you get as trajectories uh, for a certain spin direction. So it has, for example, one advantage that you have here is that you can get the distribution of the arrival times. Okay, uh, distribution of the arrival time because you know all the electrons do not take equal time to go to the to the screen. 
there is an arrival time distribution. So in fact, certainly when the screen is close enough to the source, you cannot use just psi squared as the probability to be somewhere. But here you can just simulate it and you can get everything. You can get the arrival time distribution for three, something which uh, I believe is not standard material in textbooks. Anyway, that's not what I'm talking about, but I would like to talk about that. And I have how many much time do I have? Like five minutes? Okay. Five minutes. So this paper is uh, posted in November. No, still November, so it was posted this one. And to simplify, I mean, the idea is the same, but to simplify, we take for the solution of the wave function, we take the Pauli equation in the non-uniform external field. And to simplify even more, instead of having a magnetic field, which is like spatially confined, we take it up and we do it on and off. So it's in time that we do it. So we give the electron a certain speed to go to the right or to the left for you. And then there is a certain magnetic field and then we turn it. That's a set. So we solve the Pauli equation that's what you can see in the paper for certain initial steps. Of course, we take the simplest possible initial wave function, x, y, z direction. It's a spinor, and it's only equation spinor, it's only spinor. And so we have the C plus and the C minus as complex numbers. And for the rest, we take Gaussians with a certain width in all directions, except that in the x direction, we give it a certain momentum that it can start off. And so that's how it starts off. That's initial. What do we do next? We just do Schrodinger or Pauli equation. So this is the initial condition. And now we take the initial positions of our electrons distributed with psi squared. But we, solve the Schrodinger, we solve the Pauli equation. And then once we solve the Pauli equation, we use the Pauli wave to plug in our propulsion speed and to plug in our tumbling rate. Bear with me that I'm not going to spell out the complete slide, but that's what we're doing. We give the tumbling rate, we give the velocities, and the rest is for the computer. In fact, the computer can also help to solve more complicated Pauli equations, but in our setup, we can just do it by hand to solve this Pauli equation. But the computer will help us to do this dynamics, which is just that dynamics. X dot is equal to the velocity with the chirality being the car, which is flipping in time, and always evaluated at the position where you are, and then through the wave function. So that's the guiding equation, the equation of most for the positions. We do that, and that's the pictures that we get. So here we have the initial beam, which is collimated. We have in the gray area, this corresponds to where the magnetic field is, the non uniform magnetic field. This is for an initial spinor, which has uh, the y, which is, it has a spin in the y direction. This is the color code associated to it. And once we are in the magnetic field, you see the splitting going on, and you see the discreteness in the z where it ends up. The zigzag you recognize is the constant tumbling, but there is also, while it is moving, which is not precisely visible in this picture, there is also a change in the spin vector. You see, if we say we measure spin, spin is a complicated object, right? A spin has a value, for example, electron has spin one half, this is the spin vector, but there's also spin measurement, and these are different things. So that's what we are doing. So here is like a, another spin up, but here we have a probability which is one over 10 to be to end up in the minus sign. You see less, much less trajectories end up here, and the majority ends up here. So we reproduce, of course, and since we satisfied every moment the Born rule, of course, we of course empirically verify what is supposed to be in the textbooks of quantum mechanics. There is nothing new in that. Um, that is all as expected and empirically equivalent with the standard way of doing quantum mechanics, except that we add color. Uh, and color in particular here, you see, for example, along the trajectory where you start in the y direction, then there is a change until it goes in the z direction. And you can follow all of these things just by plotting these trajectories. And even you can look at the block sphere and to understand how does it go from the spin vector in the y direction to a spin vector in the z direction, and how it goes, in fact, spiraling around 
the box field if you go along the trajectory. This is along the trajectory that you're noticing this values of these things. Okay, so another thing that is quite interesting is that you have an effective collapse. So the point is that this, this wave, this, they have like two wave packets that split, and the particles are really confined to these wave packets. So it means that whenever the particle moves away from the bulk of the wave packet, the jump, the tumbling is exactly to bring it back. If it goes in one way, it brings it back. So there is a kind of stability in the jets that you see and can visualize with these trajectories. So to have that, if you have a particle in the upper jet here, it really has a, it will be, if you measure the next time, it will have a plus in, in the Z direction, the Z, uh, up in the Z direction. Right, so, so in other words, for all, for all practical purposes, this is like a beam of spin up in the Z direction. That is, uh, is helpful, I believe, to with respect to the usual axioms as they are expressed. I have no time to express, but just let me end with something that I promised more or less. What happens with a dangle thing, which is not usually discussed in the textbooks? So the situation is as follows now. You, you take two electrons and you, you do the usual EPR experiment with entangled electrons. So one is going in this and the other in the other direction. And now you send one to a ten Gerlachek device. So one of them is sent. And now remember that you could also, so you have the typical Alice Bob situation. You can rapidly change your setup. Instead of measuring the Z direction, you can change the Y, you can measure the Y direction, right? This is the thing you have to. But this you can absolutely visualize with these trajectories. And for example, what you can see, I'm skipping all these uh, mathematics here. So this is now the trajectory of the EPR pair. So there's one right going and one left going. We have chosen such an entanglement that there is in fact no zigzagging in the beginning. But from the moment, this is the gray area, this is the spin, this is the Stergella device for the right going part. But from the moment it starts to zigzag, that one starts to zigzag. So there is this instantaneous action at the distance. Why? Because they are sitting under the same wave function, and the run and tumble depends on the wave function of the full particle space. So we get this kind of, and this is going, of course, for example, here to the plus direction in the Z. This is just going zigzag and continues to zigzag around uh, spin zero around uh, the Z equals zero axis. Okay, so this is um, much more to discuss here. Here we see also the tumbling. But the most important thing is that we again see the effective collapse to a particular wave function. I mean, all the trajectories are exactly the same as for that wave function. And again, we can see that if you rotate it in the y direction, then they would end up zigzagging in the other direction, um, and, and so on and so on. And that is, of course, the instance of what the Nobel Prize, part of the Nobel Prize for the Pell type of experiments were awarded to a couple of years. So I'm happy that also in this Karen Gallagher experiment, we can visualize that and uh, doing it via trajectory so that you have much more in your hand than just a wave function. And I think that's a comfort that we do not want to uh, ignore. Okay, so thank you very much. So I'm happy, of course, to answer questions. There was a question about what I mean by quantum trajectories, right? Is it clear? Yeah, totally. yeah so I, I can repeat it very quickly. No, um, so you, the main step is simply that you have a continuity equation for the probabilities. The continuity equation that shows you that psi squared a la borne is conserved in time. And you Add to that an equation of motion for the position. And that is guided by a wave function, the wave function, in such a way that the continuity equation corresponds to its um, to its to its density equation, to its hydrodynamic equation, so to speak. That is what is up. That's what we mean by trajectories. And that you can apply for diffraction, for interference, for stern gerlach for entanglement and I would like to promote that as a useful tool 
not only for didactical purposes for others, but also for just ourselves to have in mind how we can construct at least present the mechanics in terms of trajectories, something that has been all too often denied to, to us and our students. So one question. So in the Stangarlag experiment, actually, so in the Stangarlag experiment, actually silver atom is passing. So we are following the trajectory of silver atom. So you are describing silver atom uh, using Dirac equation. So uh, I think I know your question. Yeah. And I alluded, I mean, you have to correct me if I'm not answering correctly, but I, I think you're alluding to the fact that okay, the electrons are charged. Um, that's different from a silver atom. It's not just an electron, but you see, I did not mention that I have changed that or I have uh, corrected that because I didn't include the Lorentz force. So I just looked at a neutral particle which undergoes a non-uniform magnetic field. Right. So I did not have to correct by an electric field or so the Lorentz force. In fact, if I just would have indeed a free electron or an electron beam, stern gerlach experiment would be much more complicated. But that's not what they do. So correctly, very correctly, you're saying it's different. The Dirac electron is not like a silver atom. Silver atom being more heavy and more um, and, and neutral. But the way I'm doing the electron here is treating it as if it is like it has a charge for the non-uniform magnetic field, but it's not, I'm not in, in count, taking into account the, the Lorentz force. So in the Pauli equation in particular, I'm using the wrong approximation in the sense that the diverse of the magnetic field is not zero. Is that in the uh, direction of an answer? Also, the trajectory, you are only measuring the positions, not the momentum. I'm, I mean, every measurement that I know of is either a time or a position measurement. So then, how you can know the means trajectory means complete information of position and momentum. No, 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 no. Well, well, I mean, I'm measuring. The only thing I'm doing is measuring position. The trajectories you see there as the change in targets. But maybe I'm speaking too fast, or, or I'm not answering your question. Like how the trajectory will be well defined if I do not know the position and momentum at every instant of time. But it says I know the velocity indeed. I, I give you the velocity as a function of the wave function indeed. I give you the velocity and from this I construct the trajectory. But from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, yes. you cannot perfectly know the position and momentum simultaneously. Me or you? <laughs> Means. So I'm joking a bit. I'm joking a bit. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is absolutely not in contradiction with this. Heisenberg uncertainty gives you an inequality where the product of the variance of, for example, position and momentum under a wave function. That's fine. But that's not what I'm speaking about. I mean, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a slogan which can often be used, but not here. I mean, you know what is Heisenberg uncertainty, right? So this is not what Heisenberg is speaking about. Okay. So you are using the Lattima equation, kind of equation to describe the particle position, right? Yes. But that itself is not really a trajectory. It is just defines within the noise, right? Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so these are stochastic dynamics that I get. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. They are stochastic dynamics, absolutely. Okay. So and yeah. at every moment, it satisfies the Born rule. Okay. okay. Yes. That's true. So indeed, the jumps are stochastic. So I'm using the computer. Well, I am using. I mean, in fact, there are people, uh, luckily, like Simon Krekels and Kasper Nails, who much better than me know how to do that, um, to generate that noise and to construct these realizations of the of the trajectories. Right? Okay. Yeah. But that's the similarity when the run and tumble goes beyond just run and tumble bottom, because we can have stochastic motion in many, many different contexts, right? Sure, but it happens to be the case that for the Dirac electron, by yeah. coincidence, yeah. it's a zigzag. Okay. So the zigzag of Penrose, which is also the zigzag of Feynman, also Feynman already speaks about that. This zigzag dynamics is what we recognize in, let's say, biophysics, yeah. and except, except, of course, that, as I was mentioning, 
in run and tumble, we have constant, mostly constant propulsion speeds and run and tumble if we don't have chemotaxis. Well, for Dirac, it's an active particle, but with very complex, with rather complicated coefficients, which are governed by this spin off and makes it also a reversible dynamics. Run and tumble is an example of a non equilibrium system. The Dirac electron is reversible, in fact. And in fact, it gives us also inspiration how we can make a run and tumble particle reversible, which is important for statistical physics because we would like also to discuss run and tumble particles close to equilibrium. So the Dirac electron gives us like a way to inspire us how to make a biophysical active particle, how to discuss its close to equilibrium regime. But this is just a formal similarity, right? It is not really. A, no, this is purely a formal similarity, and of course. It is just a funny similarity, maybe. And if quantum mechanics is here, right? It's here in the wave function. It's also in the entanglement. If you speak about bacteria, I mean, as far as their locomotion is concerned, there is no quantum mechanics, right? There is no entanglement, as far as I yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. So how does this observations, I mean, uh, uh, depend on this screen distance? Maybe you have mentioned before. Yeah, the screen distance is just uh, depend. It's just making the separation larger. So if you think about the force in the z direction, um, what is it? This force in the z direction is well, as I said, is the Bohr magneton times the gradient in magnetic field. But you also have to look at the time at, during which this force acts. And this time is related to the speed that you have originally and the length, of course. If you have a bigger length, then you can separate more. So it's just the length of the screen length, the screen, the distance from the screen with respect to the magnets is just a way to, um, to see the splitting with your bad cigar thread. I mean, it's all, it's not only a tenth or whatever of a millimeter or less even, but that's. Uh, uh, don't you think, I mean, uh, uh, it will be dependent on the persistent length of this RTP? I mean, on the, but, but you see the, the persistence length. Um, well, it depends on the mass of the electron, right, right. and the mass is uh, is a measure of the persistence because it gives you the, it is related to the tumbling rate in the, in the run and tumble language. It's related to that as well. I mean, uh, if the uh, screen distance is far away from, I mean, it's very large in comparison to the persistence length. I mean, maybe we cannot observe this splitting. Kind no, of no, 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 that will not happen because they are splitting basically already at the magnetic field. And the, from the distance at which they are going just increases with the length. But that is but they, no, no, but, but it's a stable jet. No, I mean, the, there is a widening of the, of the wave packet, but at the same time, there is a, the distance is grown between the two wave packets. So I do not think it is it is important there. An interesting question that is related to you uh, question is how you go from this picture to the classical Larmor picture. And what is the classical limit of the Stern Gellert? Here you have that ability to discuss that. Really, because you see the trajectory. So you can really understand from these pictures how you can go to the classical Larmor trajectories in the same in the same computer simulation. That you can do. While in the ordinary quantum mechanics, with all due respect, you just have the wave function where it's not always clear what is the classical limit. Or you cannot just let h bar go to zero. It has to be more delicate than that. Anyways. Sometimes in random particles, uh, you Run and tumble motion in a confining potential. Yes. And then sometimes they find uh, the unimodal distribution, sometimes they find bimodal distributions, etc. Does it have any, uh, it doesn't have any analytical? I don't think so. I because you not. mentioned this stabilizing effect. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I did mention, but that potential, you see, it's a non uniform magnetic field. So it's not really a confining potential that you're having. That is not what is happening. It's a linear potential of what um, you have. So, although I understand the question, and it looks like it could have something to do with it, it has not. In fact, if I, if you allow me, much more to your question would be to understand 
the quantum Hall effect business with the edge states. That is much more related to the Roland Tombow edge states that you have. Which is I mean, you know, the topological aspects are also coming up in active matter now, but they have analogies in the kind of Hall effect uh, for electrons. That is more like an active matter, but here what you have in mind is active particles. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So here is, I mean, the slogan here is that the Dirac electron is an active particle. It's an equilibrium particle, but it's an active particle. It's never at rest. It's kind of jittery motion is all the time happening. And um, it's not in that sense, it's not like the usual Renantondo particles because it's an equilibrium as well. And you but don't if you add, yeah, you know, if you add an external field, the Dirac particle goes out of equilibrium as an active particle in the sense of always moving, and then you can have edge states also. But it gets a bit more complicated. And in the present setup, you don't suppose that if you use some particular special variation of the magnetic field. You could generate unimodal, bimodal, this. I think you could, yeah. I would, um, okay, I'm saying I'm speaking too fast, but that, I'm, I'm tempted with that. I'd like to be tempted. That's what I was thinking. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, but it's a good idea. Uh, I don't know. See these experiments, even with um, this electron, they are not like easy, so easy, no? They're still, I could imagine that something like that could happen. To exploit, in other words, what you're suggesting is to exploit even more analogies with the run and tumble phenomenology to kind of uh, to see whether the electron is obeying this kind of phenomenology. Yeah, why not? Any other yes. questions? Yes. Hello, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for this talk. Uh, my question was, uh, what happened? Uh, here, the electron uh, or uh, the particle flow in the specific direction from through the inhomogeneous magnetic field. So what happened uh, if the flow happens in a three-dimensional space or large deflection happens uh, so in the magnetic field? The, the simulation is clear or the computation are done in three dimensions. But there is a symmetry, right? But not always. You can have a spin in the y direction or a spin in the x. You can you can exploit the three dimensions in this computer simulation. So it is three dimensional. But maybe your question had a, a, I didn't understand the last part of your question. Uh, no, if a large uh, deflection happens, a, a deflection in what sense that the particle goes? Yeah, uh, for uh, silver atom, if any case. Uh, yeah, so the collimation is was done by hand here, right? By the choice of the initial wave function. I mean, in the computer simulation, you don't need to do this kind of collimation of the beam. Um, but I guess, I think, I hope this, I hope this is true that by this kind of visualization or this kind of computer animation, you can explore these things. You can explore these things to the extent that you know you solve a computer, a numerically part of the Schrodinger or Pauli equation, you put it as a run and tumble particle and you see what happens. So it's a kind of, you don't need a quantum computer to simulate quantum phenomena with this visualization. I don't know the answer, but I think it's, uh, it's one of the possibilities to explore. Why do you ask? That's far. Okay, that's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Okay, if not, let's thank Christian once more for a very nice welcome.